Hello amazing hackers, hope you're all doing well today. I'm going to talk a little bit about Postman. I'm going to give you a little bit of practical guide because I think that there's a lot of misconceptions about API testing out there. And in this first part, we're going to talk a little bit more about the theory and what Postman is, how you can use it. And then in the second part of this presentation, I'm also going to give you a more practical outlook and I'm going to do that on a laboratory that's built by, well, we'll see it later on. It's a really cool laboratory, um, but let's get started with the theory first because we'll talk about workspaces, what they are, how we can use them effectively, and then we'll talk about why you should get a, f a paid one if you want to work with bigger teams. Collections are very important. And then of course, what I find important is the requests. They need to be very, very good. So uh, the requests need to be set up properly, but we'll get more into that later. Uh, and the variables and scopes, this is extremely important, which is why I put them in here, but these are kind of in order. So first you make a workspace. Workspace contains collections, contains requests. Requests will call upon variables. That will sometimes be in the environment, sometimes global, um, sometimes, and we can also add monitors, which will run this whole thing. And this can rely on mocks uh, and stops. So that's a whole, as we say it in Dutch, that's a whole big sandwich. Let's get started, shall we? So the first thing I want to show you guys is this workspace name. Uh, you can name it something that's very easy to understand. That's what I always prefer. Something that makes it easier to look back on it. So the demo API, I just called it. The collection here is what you can uh, normally, uh, if you can import data, it's automatically, like you see here, you have an option to import data. Uh, in this case, it's going to automatically be filled in. So that's the collection name. You can have multiple collections in your workspace, of course. Here are the environments that we talked about. But here also in the top right corner, as you can see here, no environment selected. So um, you have them in two locations. We'll see what they mean later on. And then of course you have the requests themselves. Some quick links in here if you want to create one of these collections, APIs, requests. And then the team, because sometimes you might want to work with team members. Now, what's the difference between the paid and the free version? It's basically if you want to have a team that's bigger than three members, including yourself, then you're going to have to pay. And that's basically per workspace. So if you want to have your workspace with five members, you're going to have to pay for these two extra members. But you can have unlimited free workspaces uh, and you will have a collection which contain requests in your workspace. So that's about it for the structure of workspaces and that's about it for the free version versus paid version as well. It's interesting that when you look at a collection, you can share it. So if somebody asks to look at the collection, but they're not in your workspace, you can always share that collection with them. Uh, and a collection is like a group of logical calls together, like a login call, for example, then a transfer call because you always need to log in to do a transfer, and then a logout call. Those can be a logical grouping or a collection of calls. We'll run those calls in sequence. That's what the collection is for. Uh, and of course, guys, again, name it something useful so you can easily recognize it later on. You can always share that collection as well. And if we go back to this screenshot real quick, uh, basically whenever you, whenever I open one of these windows and it says here overview, then I clicked on this, this is basically it, or I clicked on workspaces and then I clicked on here. Um, and then if I show you guys the collection, then I actually clicked on the collection name. So that's how you open all these windows. <clears throat> And that's how you come back to runner as well. Now you can see the runner here on screen. It's not perfect, but it's uh, a little bit readable. I'll try to explain. So these are just the calls in sequence that we have in our collection. And we're going to run them for X amount of iterations, as we can see here, with a delay of X amount of milliseconds. And the data file, that's something that we'll come back to later on because you can also select a data file for running your collection. 
um, that's handy if you have, for example, a test environment and a dev environment and a um, um, production environment and you want to have test data for all three environments, then you can have separate files. Or what we also do is we try to uh, include some files for performance testing some files for files for edge case testing and we have a file for smoke testing so every single one of these line entries in the file will cause a new iteration to run with that specific line entry um, how you get those variables we'll see that later on but what's really important to remember is that if you want to investigate later you should check this save responses button and you can also run collections without using stored cookies. So basically it clears your cookies every time it runs. Um, that's about it for the collections and how they run. If you want to do this more th than once, if you want to do this automatically, we can set up monitors, but we'll see more about that later. First, I want to talk a little bit about requests. So this is the request itself. It's really important that you set the proper HTTP method. And you might think this is funny, but I've been struggling with this for a while sometimes. Well, I've been looking at the request, everything seems okay, but I keep getting this error and I don't know what's wrong. And it turns out I have a get request instead of a post request. So that's not very smart of me. Now the body, if any, will also come into here, of course. This is where you will see your body. Um, now at the moment you can see the parameters themselves and you can enter them like that but you can also enter raw data um, there is a response here that you can see that's also important and a status code for when something goes wrong or you can see how long it's been going on that's always important for me to know if there are requests that take 15 seconds that's not normal and that should probably be investigated but also be taken with a grain of salt because networks can be flaky of course now um what's also very useful and what not a lot of people know is you have this console right here if something goes wrong click it open and see what's wrong with your request see if you can fix it uh, I find it very useful to work with the console, but of course some people, they just work with the responses that they get back. It's totally up to you. Now for the requests, again, make sure that you check if all of these requests, they have to work independently, but they also have to work in sequence. So if I want to run my collection, I have to be able to run this one first, then get customers, get the customers copy uh, V1, V2, the put create transfer so all of these need to be executed in order uh, that's important because when i run my collection or when i run my monitor i want them to succeed all of them and uh, for example i first need to authenticate and if that one fails of course i don't want to do the rest anymore because i don't have any authentication so they're all going to fail in this case um, and it's important to make sure that they work independently and also together. Make sure that what I always do is, as you can see here, my server and my port are dynamic variables. If it will stop a switching, <laughs> sorry if it switches um, PowerPoint slide for a second. So as you can see, my server and my port are dynamic variables. Now the variables are indicated by those two squiggly lines. And then I have server and port in there. I do that because I always set them to my environment variables. That way I can set a specific server for the test server, one for the production server, and one for the dev server. So, and the port as well. And maybe the port changes sometimes. And if that server ever changes, I only need to change it in one location. I don't have to go and change it on all of these requests here. Uh, that's something that's also I wanted to show you and then of course we can also add a test here a test and a pre-request script and in here it's always useful that to check if your body contains what it should contain now for us that's going to be less useful as hackers but of course developers when, and of course QA testers as well we want to get the expected results back so that's important it might be something that you find useful i haven't found a lot of useful usefulness in it yet for hacking 
Um, and then of course the variables, we already talked a little bit about those. If you just highlight something, you can set something as a variable. In this case, if you click set as variable, it's going to also, um, it's going to bring up a dialog screen where you can select an already existing variable or you can create a new one. And the scope is going to be their global workspace in your collection or your environment. Um, now, of course, you need to select an environment before you can actually indicate that you want a variable in an environment. Otherwise, you won't see the option for environments enabled. So all of these are indicated by the squiggly lines, as we just talked about. Um, it's really easy to recognize that way. And to create a selected text and hover like we do here, and you just select it and then one of these things will pop up as we said before and then you just check it and, and see what your variable needs to be so i usually make my port and url variables that's very easy for me to switch and when we talk about data like csv imports we talked about that a little bit in the runner as well and these csv imports it's actually pretty easy because if you name the header of your csv import like this id name last name then all we have to do is name the variables like this we don't have to declare them anywhere uh, but as long as we do that every variable should be filled in and when we enter a row in the csv it's going to fill an id name and last name wherever we put these variables of course and then it's going to try again with the next record and the next record and the next record. And as you can see, you can start putting in several different test cases in there. Like for example, if you have a big list for cross-site scripting, you can easily test that with a collection runner. Just run your collection several times with every row having a different attack factor. So there are many different possibilities for this and it's not just CSV of course. You can also do this with JSON. Uh, you need that CSV header though, because it's important, otherwise your variables are not gonna get recognized. We already talked a lot about the environments. Um, I don't need to talk about them much more, I think. What is really important to recognize is that you can't easily switch environments all of the time because most of the environments are test data driven. So some test data will not be on some test environments while others won't be on others so it's very important to have your data files per environment as well and i would put them into a um a, a subversion system or a repository like github for example for me it's important to have a track record of those data files because they are basically my testing and all of this all of this uh, in postman is like a skeleton that i'm building um, what I have is collections, I run them independently. If they ever need a third party connection, like for example, if they need it's me connection, I can program that in. It's not something I always do. So what you can see here again is your environment that I have open. Um, I named it test in this case, test variable. Don't call everything test like I do, because of course that's not recognizable in the long run. Uh, remember to save a lot because if you add a variable here and you see this little orb here in the top That means you didn't save and the var variable won't be available yet um, There's no auto save in postman It's time that they invent this because auto save come on we live in 2021 But not let's not get into that um, for this persist all what it's going to do is it's going to grab the current value and put it in the initial value. Persist the current value forever into the initial value. You can also reset all, which will put the initial value back into the current value. <clears throat> Simple as that. Um, and then we have monitors as well, which is like a monitor sometimes, let's say we want to run our test every hour, then that's possible we can do that with a monitor or we can do that with the cli um, but the monitors i think they cost money after a while um, if you run x amount of tests for x amount of tests they are free so i definitely use it um, i always execute them on a certain environment and the data files are not possible there so that's important to know 
Um, there are ways to push him via the CLI, via the API, but that's not something I'm going to do a lot. Um, you can also set up alerts, so if something goes wrong, you can actually get an email, but that's totally up to you how you use it and what you use it for. I use it, for example, if uh, there is a What's New page. Mm, I check for the What's New page and I check if there are changes on it. So it's a pretty simple script runs every day if there's a new feature available it will alert me and then i can go and test it um, as for the mocks and the stubs we talked about this already a little bit you can actually set up your mocks and stubs here you can set up your calls as you can see you can set up the request url the method here is just cut, uh, cut off then you have the response code if you wanted to return something different than 200 you can set that and you can set your full body as well. Now these steps are dumb. They're going to always return static data. The problem is sometimes you have nothing to test for and you have to wait for sometimes weeks or months for your integration party to be ready and you can't delay your uh, development test long. So it's always better to have a stop in the end than nothing at all. Of course, it's very important to realize this is a stop and you still need to do testing thoroughly against the real third party system and that you need to have heavy documentation available because if you don't, it's not going to work very easily because you don't know what the server is going to return when it's built. So it's as simple as that. We usually don't need it, <clears throat> but I wanted to throw it in here anyway. So that's the end of the theoretical part. I'm going to go over the, uh, the practical part right now. Thank you for watching this part already. I hope you found it useful and I'll see you in the next one. Bye amazing hackers. Let's stop the recording. Discard, all right.